Captain Hat with me tonight. So um, the captain's program started from Docker way back when they were joining two programs, I heard. I, I just got the history recently where they had some people that are doing a lot of blog posts and other educational outreach, stuff like that. And they had another group that was out giving a lot of presentations like this or um, up in conference talks. And they combined those two. And it is a program from Docker where they look at folks that are doing a lot of the outreach, a lot of the education, in the community around Docker and other stuff in, in this ecosystem. And they, they brought them in in terms of giving us access to Docker and then also just giving us some more visibility so that they can get, get us out in the field and get us uh, communicating with the community. We're not Docker employees. That's one of the disqualifiers. As soon as you become a D Docker employee, you're no longer a captain. So that's happened to a couple people I know. <laughs> that's great. Well, thank you for thank you for the explanation, and uh, you know, really, really appreciate you coming to share with us tonight. So, without further ado, please. All right. So the talk tonight, I've got. Um, it gets a little bit into the weeds on some of the details, but I I suspect when we get into a user group like this, there's probably going to be a lot of people here that are a little bit more intro to Docker on their sides. And so I'm going to do a little bit more time on some of the intro stuff to make sure that people see some of these fundamentals. Because I think some of this, when you get into the covers of how images work, it's really interesting to see the underlying structure because it starts to make sense when you see the commands from Docker and it says it's pulling all these layers down. You get a little more visibility of what's actually happening under the covers. I, I think some of us are little engineers and we... We play around with some toys now and then, and sometimes it's fun to unscrew it and see what's going on inside of it. So the talk itself is going to be modifying immu the immutable. And what this gets to is from the OCI, and I'll get into who they are in a second, we are looking at how we can take all the different metadata that are being attached to our images and actually connect it to the image itself. And so that's that'll be an interesting challenge we'll get into here. But... First, real quick, I'm not going to dig through all this. I already gave you the quick overview of what a Docker captain is. Um, I did do a couple of talks at DockerCon, and uh, some of them were talking about a lot of my contributions to Stack Overflow. So that's what they said. Hey, you're out there educating people. We'll go ahead and bring you this program. The two key things I am going to bring up from this slide, though, is that I am an OCI maintainer. And so OCI is the open container. Um, I always forget the I. It's not institute. It's not interface. Um, initiative. That's the last slide. Always get that last slide. So that is the group that defines the standards around what a Docker container is or any container that runs on any kind of runtime out there. So when we're running these containers in the field, this is the standard that we're depending on for how we build and ship these things. And the other thing I want to highlight on here is Reg Client. You're going to see some of that Reg Client tooling on some of the slides. So when you see that, I'm the author of that one. And so I'm just using a tool that I'm familiar with. So that's why I picked that one. Not, not trying to push my tool on anybody, just letting you know, just full disclosure, that's why I pick it. So container images for a lot of you, um, I'm hoping that you realize that there are some file system layers that are happening under the covers. You'll, you'll pull down an image, and you'll see multiple steps where it's pulling a bunch of stuff concurrently. Those are each one of the file system layers that's pulling down. You've probably gone out and done a Docker build command and you've got a Docker file and it creates these things for you. You might have seen before that you can pin. Is there a question or am I just echoing back to myself? Okay, I'm gonna assume that was just me echoing. Um, you might have seen that there are um, pins that you can say you, you wanna pin an image to a specific SHA digest so that it can't be referenced by anything else. We'll talk about some how that works a little bit later on. And you've probably gone through and inspected some images before. And when you inspect it, you'll start to see like the configuration, the history, and a bunch of that stuff. That, that's an interesting detail of how that gets pulled across. And for anybody trying this lately, the latest thing that a lot of people are seeing is that you've got multi-platform images, especially anybody that's working with like a Mac M1 machine. You can't natively run the AMD 64 images. You want the ARM 64 images if you want it to run with the best performance on your machine. And there's ways we can do this in the image as well. So I'm going to get through a little bit of how all this works under the covers. And then I'll try to go fast through the new stuff because I think the, the old stuff, the fundamentals is probably the more interesting part. So this is the fundamentals. Um, Docker itself and any the whole concept of the registry, I, I like that we were seeing some stuff on registries earlier, is that it is a content addressable store. 
And what that means is my first little die just there at the top, if I curl that down and pipe that through a SHA-256 sum command at the end of that, I get the exact same digest back. It's the digest of the content is how they address that content. So they call it a content addressable store. And in this one, I'm just pulling back a single blob and that blob happens to be a tar file, a compressed tar file. And so you can see all the different files in here. Happens to be busy box you can see showing up in a bunch of this. This is actually an Alpine image. So if you've ever dug into an Alpine image under the covers, it's busy box with a package manager on top of it. So the other interesting part that of what's going on in these container images is instead of pushing a tar file, we can push some JSON. And the JSON that I'm pushing in this case is going to have the config, um, environment variables, the command you're going to run, the working dir that you're kicking off in, any of those details that come through with the configuration of the image, including all the history steps, all the pieces that went through building this image, all that's tracked in the config as well. You can inspect an image and find out what, what those look like. That's all shipped as a separate blob in addition to our file system blob. So we get these two pieces together. These are the two fundamentals of a container image. You, you've got all your file system layers, you've got the configurations, you need to put these together. And to put these together on a registry, the tool they use for that is yet another piece of JSON. It's we, we're very consistent in our simplicity here. And this yeah. JSON yeah. includes two structures in there, one or um, two sections in here. And the first one at the top is the config and the one down below is all the layers that we pack together. So that, and each one of these things is called a descriptor is the term that they use in their CI. The descriptor includes your digest, the size of it, the media type, and maybe some other data on top of that. So when you hear me say descriptor over and over again, it's it's just this structure that includes the digest and the digest tends to be the very important part that a lot of people care about. So with this, we can push this up to a registry, goes instead of the blob API, goes to a manifest API, but they're pretty similar. And with that up on the registry, we can take the same, di the same um, SHA-256 checksum of this content when you serialize it and you get and another digest out of that. So with that, we've got this digest here, this is the digest that you would pin an image to. When you say, I want to pull an image with a specific SHA-256 checksum, this is the one you're pulling down because it contains the whole st structure at the top. So you can say, Docker, run this image with this pin, and it is looking, it'll pull this manifest. In addition, if you're talking about pulling an image down, you probably are pulling it down with a tag, and a tag is just a symbolic link to a manifest. And so you can have multiple tags pointing to one manifest, you can have a tag that used to point to a manifest A and now later on points to manifest B. And it's just a pointer to one of those digest out there. And then this picture is kind of the rest of what we were just creating. It's going to be the config and a bunch of layers that we create. All right. Importantly, the green boxes, those blobs, you can put whatever you want in there. But the blue boxes, the registries care about. And that'll come up as a challenge we run into later on. The nice thing we get out of this is immutability. And so what immutability means for a registry is that we've got this concept of a Merkle tree. If anybody remembers that from your college days, it's when you have the structure where every node has the hashes for each of its child nodes. And so if the hash of any one of the child nodes change, the hash of that parent node changes. And so you get this structure where you can verify that nothing changed just by looking at that root node at the very top. We've also got a directed acyclic graph, and that just means there's no circles in this looping structure. You start from one node, you work all the way down to the tree, you never loop back on yourself. So that's another nice feature out of this. And the content addressable store we saw earlier on. You put all these together and we have a nice concept of immutability. Whenever you have the digest for that image, you know that it hasn't changed. So before I get into what the problem is that that creates for us, I wanna circle back to a couple other fundamental details. One is these multi-platform images you've probably seen. And the way we push that is it's a different manifest type. So instead of being an image manifest, this is a manifest list. In OCI, we call it an index, but it's the same kind of structure. It's just slightly different from the Docker name. And we have a different kind of descriptor in there. So instead of the descriptor having just the digest, the media type, and the size, we've also included a platform in there. And that's because when we start listing multiple manifests inside of one of these, we want to be able to look up which one we're going to pull down from this list. And so from the client side, you pull this and you see five or six different manifests. You also see the platform for each one of those. So you know which one of these you need to pull for your local machine. And so that comes to be very useful when you're looking at these manifest list. You need some kind of extra bit of metadata. 
when we put this structure together, we get a little bit bigger picture. And so you've got the index, you've got a bunch of manifest under that index, and you got your tag that will just point to that top level index so that when you point to that tag, anybody, whatever platform they happen to run on, will find the manifest for their platform that way. So this is how we get those multi-platform images that'll work on the Mac, just as well as they work on all the other people on the Intel machine. As we go through, and apologies, Zoom is doing some funny stuff on me here. The other important detail, if anybody's played around lately, we've got artifacts you can push up on a registry. Things like Helm charts have been getting pushed to registries. I've seen people put uh, Debian images up on a registry. It's not just for pushing just container images. There's a structure you can push a lot of other things in there. And what we change, we'll take the same image manifest and we will change the media type on this config descriptor to be something unique that's not an image config. So it's just in this example, I'm using a, a bill of materials for electrons. And I just said, this does contain electrons. And conveniently, they all do. And the layer at the bottom is just the content of whatever we want to ship. And so I just shipped a string in there, but I could have shipped some JSON. I could have shipped a tar, could have shipped all kinds of stuff. The registry doesn't care because this is one of those blobs down below. And so you can pack whatever you want to, a cat picture, whatever you want to ship to an artifact, you can ship it up this way. And you just have to have this manifest that's a wrapper and then your blob in the bottom there that's just whatever your data is, your payload. All right, so we can do this today. We can ship this up right now. And what we've been seeing is a challenge where in the security space, everybody has been talking about SBOM, SBOM, SBOM. Just came back from out in Seattle. We had a um, the Cloud Native Security Conference, and I would say at least half the talks include at least some mention of an SBOM. That's the software bill of materials. That's kind of the ingredients list of what's going on inside of our application package that we ship out. And with a container image, that should be the bill of materials for all the contents of our container image. That's kind of what they want to ship out. And we've got a lot of tools out there today that will generate this stuff. You got a lot of these security scanners or a whole bunch of tools for individual languages out there that will generate these bill of materials. We're starting to get some stuff on the other side to consume it. So some of these vulnerability scanners, if you pipe uh, SBOM into it, it will skip scanning the whole image itself. And it will work off that bill of materials and say, we know these three different packages you shipped inside of this image are vulnerable. So that's an issue. There's also tools out there that are building this nice big query database. So you can go and query and say, tell me all the places that I've got this old version of OpenSSL sitting out there or an old version of um, Log4j that's sitting out in our production environment. You can just query a nice database and it will tell you everywhere that has that from this bill of materials. So we can generate it and we can consume it. In the Docker land, you would think about build, ship, run. Well, we're missing that middle stage or we're missing that ship stage in, the, in, in between the two. And that people have talked about, can we make maybe a central database that's run by the government? I'm based out of DC, so I couldn't make the road trip down there to Atlanta night. But in, in DC, the famous you know comment there is, we're with government, we're here to help. And I, I'm pretty sure there are a few people down there that uh, do not want the government helping them in this case. They, they'd much rather run it themselves. So... Instead of doing that, we've got um, options where maybe you could do a custom distribution of SBOM for every single application. So you have your releases repo or your releases under the under your GitHub repo. Maybe you got a website you're putting it to. That's bad for the users because the users are looking at like 20 different places with these SBOMs. What we really want is to be able to say for an image, if I pull down V3 of my image, tell me the SBOM for that image. And so we're looking for a way we can attach it and we only know the information about that V3 and that V3 is pointing to that immutable digest. And so how do we work that out? That's kind of the challenge we looked at from the OCI side. And we're looking at all this of how can we push that up there? Because if we put the metadata directly in that manifest in any of the manifests up there, that would modify the digest manifest. So that, that creates an issue, especially for anybody that was pending to that old digest. And so how can we do it? Well, OCI spun up a working group to try to solve this challenge. And we had a bunch of goals that we were looking at. So a whole bunch of goals on that list. I'll just put up a couple of them where we're looking at things like efficiency. How can we attach and detach for downstream users? Because upstream may include a bunch of vulnerability scans or SBOMs or other details from their side. When you bring this into your organization, if you start copying images down to your own local registry because you're on your own DTR server or something like that, you may want different things attached to it. You might want to run your own scan, generate your own SBOM. You might want to attach your own signature <laughs> for putting assigned images. That's different from upstream. So you want to be able to attach and detach without changing anything underneath of it. 
And we are also looking at the challenge of trying to predict what we're going to do in the future. And we've had some standards that came out before that were saying, this is how we're going to do it for a signature. This is how we're going to do it for an attestation. That attestation, if you haven't heard that term before, it's when people are building images, they can put a claim on top of each individual build step and said, I had this input, I generated this output, I am so-and-so that ran this command. They, they sign each little individual step. And that's useful for, some, for people who are doing a lot of auditing out there. So a lot of different kinds of data that we're generating, but we didn't know what people were going to push next. You know, if I started pushing CAD images tomorrow, we haven't built the standard around CAD images. We wanted to build a solution that was going to be able to handle that. The good thing about all this is that we didn't have to invent anything. There are actually multiple solutions out there that already existed that did all this for us. And our challenge was actually picking between them. So I'll, I'll run you through three of them we were looking at. One of them came from a project called ORAS, O-R-A-S. And what they created was a new, one of these blue bobs in the picture here. Instead of having the manifest for images or the manifest for an index, they create a new manifest for just an artifact, a generic artifact. And so instead of that config and the layers, they said, just give me a list of blobs. And maybe I don't need any blobs at all. Maybe it's just some other metadata that's inside the artifact and you don't even have to push any external data. So they made a lot more flexible data structure, but they put one extra descriptor in there. And the extra descriptor was this subject field that pointed back to the manifest. Now from the manifest, so I'm looking at the version three over there and I'm saying, I pulled down my image in this version three and I'm gonna run it with all these layers in the config. I can't follow that backwards because that's pointing into me. I don't have anything on the manifest to go back. And so we had to create a new API on the registry that said from this manifest with this digest, tell me all the artifacts that point to me. So they had a new API they were creating and a new new media type for this manifest. That has a few challenges when you do this in a registry though, because registries only know about a fixed set of manifest. And when you change it, an old registry that was built like the DTR day wouldn't know how to recognize that artifact manifest and it would just reject it. Doesn't know how to parse it, it just rejects it because registries store doing stuff like garbage collection. Registries are actually parsing that manifest and they look through and they say, I've got these five layers, maybe some other layers pushed before for a previous version three. Nobody's referencing anymore. I can clean that up. Well, it has to be able to parse that manifest to do that logic. So we've got this structure in there, but this is only going to work on a new registry because we're only going to be able to push this artifact to a new registry after we upgrade it. So with OCI, we had another option, which is that we can extend any of these existing data structures. It's just JSON. So we can add another field into the JSON. We've re reserved that in the spec where we can add new fields in there. So we said, what if we just add this subject field to the manifest, to that image manifest we already have today? The way we're already pushing things like Helm charts up to a registry server today. So we thought that would be a good option. We still have the challenge though, that without that new API on the registry, we can push this content to the registry, but we can't find it. We don't have a way to query it. So we still had a challenge we we're trying to solve there. So with an existing registry, if we don't upgrade anything at all, we can use this tag. Um, we, we made a new tag that's just the digest dash and the digest content. And so this is, instead of having the, the normal digest, when you pin an image, you're saying, pull it out as image, add in the digest colon and the rest of it. Well, if you just change that from a colon to a dash, that was all we use for our tag syntax. Just that simple. We just changed one letter in there and now we had a tag instead of a, a pin digest to that manifest. And so with that, we were able to say for any given manifest, tell us all the metadata because this tag can point to all kinds of stuff. And so we just pick where we want to point to. It could even point to an index of multiple things. And so you can have multiple artifacts associated with it. So this was kind of flexible. So, so this is nice. And you might be saying, okay, great. You, you just showed me three different options there. Which one do you pick? Um, because there were some nice things if we do an upgrade and we push everything to the latest and greatest, um, but there were also downsides because we want to still have some kind of upgrade path for people to have old registries out there that don't have that time to upgrade things. And the answer is amongst all those options is that we, we just said, yes. Um, <laughs> hey, which one do we pick? Um, the, the great thing about when you have a design by committee is that, you know, just throw everything in there, do it, do it all, do it all together. And so we did add the artifact manifest. I will put a big star next to this because that is currently up for debate. Um, we merged it into main, but we haven't tagged release. And as we're talking about releasing it, there've been some back and forth on this one. We'll see if we can work this out still. 
Um, we also add the subject to that was already on the artifact manifest. We add that subject to the image manifest. And we decided we're going to add the referrers API because that's a nice, efficient way to query a registry. But we said for any registry that hasn't been upgraded yet, also include that tag API. Graphically, what that's going to look like is this a little, gets a little bit more complicated. But the nice thing about this is that for most artifacts, you're only going down one path on this right, right hand side. So you pull down your V3, you get your manifest, you've got all your layers and your configs. Now, this is your image over here. And you say, take the digest of this manifest and go query on this side. Try the refers API first because that's nice and efficient. If the refers API comes back, the registry says, I don't know what the heck you're talking about. I'm an old registry. I don't know these new fang, new fang things. Um, you go back and pull the tag. And regardless of which of these two you query, you get the exact same response back, which is an index, a manifest list. So it's a list of all the pointers to all the different manifests that are here. And we'll get back the manifest of an image manifest that has all the stuff in there where you have your custom config, or if you have a new manifest that has some new features, you may also see some of these artifact manifests out there. So you got both of those. Got two different paths. More than likely what you're gonna see on day one is you're gonna see this left-hand path where you have the tag that points to an index that will point to the old image manifest that's wrapped like that. So that's kind of what we created. And before I go too much farther, I wanna answer a question that comes up over and over again for me which is I told you we add the subject field to the image manifest. We add the subject field to this new artifact manifest, but I kept mentioning we had this index manifest out there. And I keep getting asked from people, can we add a subject field to this index manifest? And I keep telling them no and, and done. I just leave the conversation at that point without giving an explanation. No, I, I do explain it because they keep asking over and over again. But I want to, before I dig into that too much farther, I want to first say that if you have an artifact and or anything with a subject field, it can point to an index. It's just the index itself can't have a pointer out of it. And the, so you can have a signature and SBOM attached to a multi-platform list. That would be a good thing. But we don't have some kind of multi-platform manifest pointing to something else. The reason we didn't do that is because one of those little properties we were talking about earlier, where we said this whole registry is a directed acyclic graph. And what that means is there are no loops. If, if we were to allow this index to point with a subject field to um, another image, the way you walk this is you would say, give me the version three tag out there. I'll go find the image that that tag points to. We know this digest. I could generate an index that has both the subject and the child field of that index with the same digest. I know that digest in advance, I can, I can generate this. And by doing that, when I say, okay, I've got this image, query that refers API and tell me everything it refers to me. Well, this subject link here, I kind of walk it backwards. And so while the links are all nice and straight and there are no loops in there, the way I logically walk this is I walk backwards on that subject link and then I walk forwards over here and then I walk backwards over here and then I walk forwards over here. We just create a loop. And so loops are bad in the whole container ecos in the whole registry ecosystem. And so he said, let's not do that. The other thing that I want to point out is for garbage collection. Um, one of the challenges when we started putting this stuff up there is that people didn't want to have to tag every single artifact. You'll have signatures out there. You'll have a lot of S bombs. Your registry gets really cluttered if all these things are tagged. And so as long as they're pointing to something in the subject field and this thing is tagged, either indirectly or directly, we assume this artifact is still referenced. And so you don't have to worry about this getting automatically cleaned up by your registry server, just by the fact that we are that we have that sitting out there with something else that it's pointing to that is tagged. So we, we did consider that one. If you're in the fallback scenario, the registry doesn't know about this stuff, doesn't understand it, you have a tag that is pointing to this artifact already because that was that fallback tag that we had above earlier. All right, so we create this big complex thing I show you some code earlier. I'll show you a little bit more code right now, which is when I query that thing and I get that index back from the registry, what I get back, so I'm going to take at the top here, I'm just pulling down um, my manifest and I grabbed an Alpine manifest. There's a header in there from this API call when I ran this curl and it came back and it said, okay, your digest is F271E. I took that same thing, changed the colon to a dash. That's my tag now. And if I curl that tag, I get back this index. So it's exactly what you're expecting from that slide earlier. In here, I'm going to get the, the list of these, um, these manifest. So all these descriptors here. And instead of having that platform field, I've got two different fields here that I've 
that I'm looking at. Um, two new fields. One is annotations. Annotations are always there, but you rarely see them at this level. And so now you actually see the annotations included. And the other field in there that's really useful is this artifact type. Both of these were pulled up from the manifest itself. And so from our artifact that we pushed up, here's an example of what an artifact looks like. I pulled up this config media type and I pulled up these annotations up to my manifest list. So now I'm looking at a manifest list and I query and I see, okay, for this V3 image, I've got this list of like 12 different artifacts that all point to my manifest. I can figure out from within there, which one is the SBOM I'm looking for, which was the newest SBOM. If you have built multiple of these things, look for the most recent vulnerability scan. I can find the signature that was signed by somebody I trust because maybe they put a uh, fingerprint on top of that uh, key. So you can figure out which key you want to look for that signed your image. And so we have a way to look for what content we want to find efficiently without having to pull down every one of these manifests for every one of these artifacts. So that's a nice convenient way to minimize how much we're hitting the registry and speed up these requests. So that was a lot of, uh, lot of low level details. And I'm sure a lot of people look at this and they say, well, that, that sounds like really complicated. I don't want to have to do any of that. I've got good news. I'm going to show you the easy button on all this stuff. I, I show the hard way because sometimes it's nice to be able to see under the covers. But what I will spin up is two different registries here. One of these registries I'm going to spin up on port 5001. The, that port 5000 something comes up really common when you see people playing with registries. And I'll spin up a second one of 5002. And for both of these, I'm going to set a couple variables for the media types because all my media types in this case, I kept simple. One is the OCI index and the other is just an OCI image. So between the two of those, that covers all the different objects I'm going to create. So I create a couple of these variables. And then I'm going to spin up this first registry is the distribution, the CNCF distribution, which is the registry colon two. That's the same thing you were seeing earlier that's running in the back end of DTR. It's a really common registry that's been imported into a lot of projects, even like Harbor and some of these other projects out there use the same registry. This has not been upgraded though. So this registry doesn't know how to talk with the new stuff. That registry only knows all the old 1.0 stuff without the new API, without the new artifact manifest. To try the new stuff, I spun up a second registry here. It's called Zot. Um, probably something that most people haven't heard of, but they jumped on board early. They implemented some of the release candidate work that we were doing. And so they have this new API that we're working with. So I can show you the new fancy stuff, how it looks a little differently. For each of these, I turn off TLS because setting up TLS inside of a um, demo is a pain in the neck. And then I'm gonna pull down a single platform for my image that I've got. And I'm kind of dog fooding myself because I need to find an image out there that had this um, had this stuff in an OCI format. And so I find that most images out there, if you look for them, they still ship with the Docker media types for their manifest. And I'm going to copy this image down. And the copy is pretty quick because um, my image isn't too large here. And when I pull this image down, I show it, you're going to see the, the image manifest here which include a bunch of layers, the config, and you can see it's just a single platform image. So that I did mention there, there are some of those regcuddle commands there that, like I say, that's my tool. I just know how to use it. So that's the one I pick on, but uh, there, there are a few other tools out there that do some similar stuff like this. So that is just the setup. Nothing new about this. That is just the spinning up one registry with one image so that we can start playing. Because what I want to show you now here is the easy button. Say you're building your pipeline and you want to attach an SBOM. So I've got a scanner here. This scanner is called SIFT. I believe it's from Anchor. Um, they're one of the groups out there that do things like vulnerability scanning, a bunch of other interesting tools around the container ecosystem. And there are two different formats for building an SBOM. One of them is called Cyclone DX. It comes out of the OWASP group. The other method of generating an SBOM is called SPDX, and that comes out of Linux Foundation. So... I picked one, I did the Cyclone DX and I passed it into this regcuddle artifact put command. And I also include a bunch of other things in here, the artifact type that I wanted to pass in, the manifest type just for the individual layer and some annotations. And now you, in the second command here, you see me picking SPDX because when you go to a security conference and you start talking SBOMs, if you pick a favorite, someone's gonna like come after you later on and you know, bad things might happen. So I, I don't want to pick favorites when I'm talking to the security people about this stuff. So I now have two different SBOMs. Both of these have been attached to my image. And by saying in the artifact put command dash s subject, I'm saying, I'm not just pushing this artifact up to the registry. I'm pushing this artifact up that references another image that's already there. 
And so this reg cuddle command did everything. This right here in a nutshell is all you have to do as an end user. So as an end user, if you're building your images, you can go up in your pipelines and just say, build a scan, run this thing. My SBOM must attach my image, ship it out. You're done. Nothing else to do from that point forward. The, the key piece there is that anybody that's copying the images later on is going to need to be able to copy the image with the SBOM attached. There's some extra flags in some of my commands to do that. But from you as a builder, your work is done at this point. And so we try to keep this as simple as possible. Awesome. All right. So now the, the other half of this. So now we built it. We shipped it up to registry. Now let's see if we can pull it back down. So now we need to use it. And so for that, again, I'm picking all my own tooling because it's the tool I'm familiar with. And I ran that artifact list command and that just showed a list of all the different artifacts. So I just scroll back up here so you can see that this was that image index. And in that index, there were two manifest lists. One was a Cyclone DX and the other one was SPDX down below. And you see both the annotations that got pulled up and the artifact type that got pulled up. And you can add multiple annotations in there. I only pick one, just to keep it, keep the screen not too busy. The tag listing, you're gonna see that fallback tag showing up in there. And if you look the app tag that I copied earlier on, it's refer is represented by this little digest variable. If I strip off the SHA-256 colon and then reattach a SHA-256 dash, that's how I can convert this from, from one uh, field to another. And so I'm gonna run this manifest git command and I will get back that exact same response from that artifact listing because they were the same thing. So I'll even scroll back up and show you this real quick here. The Annotations and whatnot are the same, even the image index, and it's the same field from before. It's the same response because we were when we queried the registry, it didn't have the refers APIs. So what it was doing was querying this tag. And so that's how we got the response back. All right. So from that, we want to get the artifact itself now. And so I've got my artifact git command. I pass it a dash dash subject field. And so this says go find an artifact that points to this image. And then I want to filter because I got two different artifacts to point to there. I'm going to filter and say, give me just the Cyclone DX artifact. And when I do this, now what I'm going to see is it's going to pull back just the Cyclone DX, spit it right to standard out. I could have piped it to a file or something. But now I have for the consumer side, they can consume this artifact. They can consume this SBOM or whatever else we want to ship to the image. So we've got that full end-to-end -end workflow. Where we can build it, attach it, ship it, consume it down below. Just that easy. Now I showed you from my side, a bunch of the commands I was running. All this stuff, if you wanna see this, I've got these demos up online, this, this whole presentation deck is sitting online. You can pull these down and see that you can dig through step-by-step step and see the curl commands. I ended up writing my own tool, the, the reg call tool, just because this stuff, when you start getting into it, you start passing headers in there, you start passing authentication, it gets really complicated really quick, but feel free to dig through this if you have a registry that doesn't have authentication turned on, you really wanna, play around with the low level APIs, you can see exactly what I was doing for each one of these to go through step-by-step step of pulling down at a specific manifest and then a specific bit, a specific blob from that manifest. But I told you there were two registries we spun up. So the second registry was the SOT registry. This is on so. 5002 instead of 5001. So let me copy the image from A to B and I pass that dash hash refers. And by doing that, I said, not just copying the image, but also copying that SBOM that was both SBOMs that were there. And you can see those are both there now. But because it's an upgrade registry, it doesn't have that extra little fallback tag anymore. We actually have an API that we can hit on this registry. Even if I hit this manifest API, you know, look there in that URL that I'm passing, I'm saying, give me the manifest with this digest field in there. If I query that for this digest, what you're going to see it come back from this is that it's going to say not found or for it's a manifest unknown. That's because we don't have the tag on this registry anymore. I didn't have to push that up. I didn't have to manage that as a client. The registry is doing this all for me now. And since the registry is doing it, I can hit this new API called refers, pass it the digest of the manifest that I pulled down, my application manifest. And it'll say, okay, here are all the things that refer to that digest. And so we got a second way of doing this on an upgrade registry. There's another demo that I tend to skip past a little bit because it gets a bit tedious later on, but for anybody that's ever worked in like an air gap environment, if uh, you you might have like Coca-Cola there that wants the the secret recipe for all their ingredients of the, you know the Dasani, because um, I, I hope nobody knows what the secret ingredient is in there. Um, <laughs> if if you're trying to hide that stuff behind air gap, you can use a you can use a layout called the OCI layout, 
where they've got a file system structure for how they put all these things onto the file system. What that has is a file in the directory called uh, index.json. It is uh, conveniently an OCI index. In there are all the different tags. And then also is this blobs directory with a SHA-256 checksum. You can't say that fast. I try it. You just can't say that fast. That whole blob listing is your content addressable store. And so each one of these things that points to a digest, they're all going to be listed inside that blob directory there. And then from there, you can find all the other content that's listed in there. So if you ever need to ship this stuff from one server to another, there is a way to do this with a file system without having to go over the network. You can actually sneak your net across. All right. So I picked on my tool a lot. There are other tools out there. Uh, the ORAS project was one that has been working on this stuff as well. And so they've got their way of doing it, both from the old and the new. And so with the tag fallback and with the new API, they can pull up this listing and tell you all the artifacts point to things. Additionally, I'll show you that I can create this on a registry right now on an image that I've pushed up to the real world, GitHub container yeah. registry. This stuff exists today. And so this isn't something that just works in my lab. This is stuff that's actually out on servers. You kind of pick and choose your servers. There are a few that don't like this new format just yet. Um, few registries are filtering out some of these things, but most registries out there today, if, if they've implemented the OCI spec the way the OCI spec was written, I've pushed out the, in this case, the Docker ad stations, the Cyclone DX and the SPDX SBOM attached to my image, pushed up on a registry and it just works. And same idea if I run this ORUS discover command here, where I query the same external registry, but with ORUS again, it's going to find the same data. So pick your tool. They all work out there, write your own tool, and we got the solution. So I suspect there are not a lot of people out there are running their own registries or they're not implementing their own registries. If you were, I would tell you, hey, please don't filter on this stuff. There are two out there that I know of. So I think this is probably a small enough group that I don't mind saying. Docker Hub is one of those that was supporting all the latest and greatest features and they pulled it back just recently because they know that we on the OCI are still back and forth on a couple of these details. And they said, well, until you finish this up, we're going to be a little conservative on our, our side. The downside is that they filter if you ever push anything up there with that subject. So not just the new artifact manifest that we're debating on, but anything that had that subject field in the manifest, which means some of the stuff I can't push up to Docker Hub anymore. In addition, I think it was Amazon's ECR that was filtering anytime you push a manifest with a field that it didn't recognize, they said, we don't know what to do with that. So we're going to reject it. OCI says, please don't do that, but some registries still do that. And as long as that doesn't happen though, you can use this on registries today. So if you're pushing like a Harbor, if you're pushing a GitHub container registry, pretty sure GitLab, a whole bunch of these others, DTR, all this stuff, it will just work. And so there's nothing you have to do on the registry side to upgrade it, to use this stuff. It's upgrading to get better functionality out of this. And so we're, we're, want that better functionality in the future, but it's what we're doing today, it just works. From the client side, um, for portability, use that image manifest. So uh, we pitched this to the community. We said, hey, we got this new feature and everybody saw, oh, you got a new manifest. Everybody said new shiny, we're just gonna use new shiny right on day one. We, we had to tell them to pace yourselves. It takes a while for an entire ecosystem of registries all over the place where everybody's got their own local installed registries and in-house their own DTR instances. It takes a while to get all this stuff upgrade, give people time to do that, not only for the registry servers, but also the downstream tooling it's using it. Just realize it's going to take some time. For the fallback, um, if you're a client that's implementing this stuff, the client itself is responsible for managing that fallback tag. So that's where tools like the Reg Cuddle, like Oris and these other places, they manage that fallback tag for you. Otherwise, whenever you push one of these things up to registry, it has, has that subject field in it. You have to query, does that fallback tag exist? pull it down. If it does, add your entry to it and then push a new new value of that index to that fallback tag up to the registry. And when you do that, the challenge is that you might get any some of these race conditions. That's where having the registry do this for you is a lot better because the registry doesn't have race conditions. It's just eventually consistent. But for the clients, there's the challenge. You might have two things that are both building images, both adding S bombs on it and stepping on top of each other. And so that's the one risk we have with this fallback method. I'll also mention we want to pick an appropriate artifact type. And so what I use in here is from the IANA standards. They maintain a whole bunch of these media types up on their side. And each project that creates a well-known media type up there tends to register it with IANA. 
And so I pick these things that are already registered up at that central site. By picking something that's well-known and registered, that means that my SBOM, my machine, and your SBOM on your project, everybody's SBOM, different projects, we can query those regardless of what image we're pulling down with the same command, just swapping out the image name and not having to know what was the artifact type for this one. It, it's nice we just all use the standard in that case. Lastly, I'm going to point out one last catch here, which is annotations. Um, it is really tempting to throw everything in the world in an annotation. They're a lot like labels, um, just stored in a different place. People started putting a lot of things in there, and registry operators said, wait a minute, we've got to generate this refers API response. One of the things we're pulling up into that response is all these annotations. We don't want to pull the whole world into our uh, database because we're going to have to start indexing a database and all these things. So if we start seeing someone that pushes a whole bunch of stuff and makes this really massive annotation list inside of a manifest, they're just going to reserve the right to refuse the manifest itself. So you won't be able to push the manifest to their registry. So because of that, please use the annotations responsibly. Don't put the whole world in there. Just put the stuff in there you need to be able to query later on. All right. A couple of catches with this. Um, I mentioned some of this stuff is still new. We're still working through it. We, we pushed everything into the main branch, but that's still being iterated on. We're still updating and changing stuff, we haven't tagged a release on this yet. And so because this isn't released by the OCI, there are some of the stuff that's still in the works, but from the registry side, they're in various stages, client tooling, a whole lot of various stages out there. And the big push I'm saying is that if you're looking at this stuff from the client side now, this is a great opportunity to start playing around with this stuff, put it in the lab, try it out, see if it works for you, try to do some workflows, see how it looks and give us feedback to their problems, but otherwise just be ready for when this stuff starts to come down the pipeline in the near future. And so with that, I appreciate it. Um, I hope everybody didn't have too much of a food coma there and feel free to throw some questions at me. Yeah, anyone have some? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, yeah, so I, I think you may have, um, reference this, uh, but like, what are um, examples of S-bombs or what are different use cases? I feel like we've talked about use cases already um, throughout this uh, session, but um, are you able to, uh, to attach any kind of artifacts? So like, let's say you want to attach um, like PNGs, images, what have you, um, a tar file. It seems like that's the case, but. Yeah, anything you can put inside of a blob, which is any kind of byte stream. You can put it in there and attach that as an artifact, and that artifact can have the subject field, which references your image, and then that's how they get attached to each other. So anything you can throw in there, you can do that with. The huge value of the S-bombs themselves, the reason that that keeps coming up so much in my day to day is because these are becoming so prolific in the generation side. We're starting to build these and generate these for everything, but we haven't done the second step of how do we associate them with the image we're pulling down. And so people are having to find a way of saying, okay, I pulled down this image. Where was the S-bomb for Alpine version three? Who, who generated that or do they have to generate themselves? So having this just built upstream and attached already, that's a huge value add. Okay, cool. Uh, really quickly, just a follow up to that. Um, I think I missed where exactly you were specifying in the uh, JSON um, or the manifest uh, specification, the actual data content itself. I know I saw a bunch of hashes. Um, is that a separate step? Was it just like an assumption? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. I think I mentioned somewhat in the artifact itself. When you generate an artifact, we've got the regular image manifest. This is the media type of whatever this thing is. And so this was the image manifest. There are two pieces in there. One is the config and the other is the layers. Each one of these has their own media types in there. And so the media type right here on this config descriptor, that's the critical one that says... This is, in this case, the electron bomb. I was earlier saying SPDX and Cyclone DX in this field right here. So by putting it in here, it says I'm no longer an image because when we have this field inside of images, this has a specific value for an image. Is that was that where you're going with that question? Um, somewhat, yeah. Uh, so it seems like sort of metadata about the actual um, um, underlying artifact. I'm curious about how you actually upload the, uh, the content of the artifact itself, but it's, I guess it's just like a regular image. You sort of like build that separately and now you're just sort of yeah. kind of referencing. It, the content is in this case down here, this second digest at the bottom. This is just, in this case, it was a string that had this long descriptor. And there's an API where you just say, I want to push this content up 
as a new blob. And so there is a blob upload API into an OCI. Same as the blob upload when you're pushing up a layer, anything else in a, anything else goes up to your image, it's the same API it gets pushed up there. So you get these digest from your blob of your push. And then you just say, for this one blob, I'm just going to put that down in this part of the manifest. And that's how you say this manifest has this blob in it. Uh, makes sense. Cool. Other questions? Yeah. Do you have something that, or um, that will actually scan like the blobs or whatever people are attaching to confirm nobody is attaching something malicious? Or is that just based off of the owner of uh, whatever repository you're tagging to that they have to do? Yeah, part of this comes down to trust who you're pulling your images from. And part of that is a, another big use case of this is image signing. So what the third option there, we started picking the, the special tag syntax. The people that um, really started that one was the SigStore project, which has a cosign tool for signing images. They're pushing the tag very similar to what we recommend on the, on the third option where they've got this signature that says this image was signed by such and such. It's very handy to make sure you're pulling down images there from trusted parties and being able to verify that signature is a key part of that. So yeah, definitely you want to pull down from a trusted source. There's nothing that says they can't put something malicious in there if they're the image author. Um, the place you really worry about isn't really that this all this extra metadata, the place you really worry about is that they modified the layer content itself and they pushed down some bad binaries inside of the, inside of the image. Now you're running it on your server. So I, I would say make sure that you're, in that case, just that you trust your image sources more than anything else. Yeah, but a slightly tangential question. Uh, uh, I came to the talk because I was actually, my director asked me to look into uh, code signing. So it was like that tool you mentioned, like SIFT, one of those tools, or if you could just point out some, uh, where can I start since I'm an absolute noob at this kind of stuff? Yeah, the container image signing right now, the popular tool I've seen, there, there are a few tools that do container image signing. So this is a step removed from code signing. The, in the container ecosystem, we don't really do the code signing on our side. That might be done with whatever you put into the image. But once it's in the image, what we look at is signing the overall image itself. And from that used to be the notary v1 tool that ships right now with probably still in the DTR tool itself that Docker was building on the enterprise before they gave that off to Mirantes. So that's out there. That's being phased out for a version two that they're still finishing up. The one that's really picked up a lot of steam in the ecosystem is that SigStore Cosign project. And so if you go out and look up SigStore, look up Cosign, that project is doing the sign right now for container images. And they've Got a whole lot of models around that. There are a whole bunch of talks on that one at the conferences lately. So they've they've been getting a lot of attention. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any others? All right. Let's give Brandon a hand. I have another mission for you, Brandon. Uh, we have since you're. Uh, you know, we have to pick two winners tonight and I have everyone's name of those who entered on an Excel spreadsheet. So we're gonna have you pick two numbers tonight and hopefully those people are here. Uh, you have that ready? Four through 23 uh, are your numbers. Yeah, pick a number four. Four through 23, 23. any two numbers from that? Four through 23, I wanna say 42, but um, <laughs> let me go with half of 42 and say 21. Okay. Um, let's, figure, let's see who get the first winner first. Make sure this is. First winner is Wilbur Tinsley. Are you here? Yeah. And one more winner, uh, one more number between four and 23, but don't pick 21. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll try not to pick the same number. Um, let's just go with lucky number seven. Number seven, Narahari Lakshmi. All right. <laughs> Hopefully next time we'll have you in person um, and, uh, and you'll take me up or you'll take me up on the offer for the pizza next time. Okay. Awesome. It uh, was a pleasure coming out here to chat with you tonight. And I'm just so excited to see you guys getting back in person. We're starting to do that up here and it's just great to, great to get back to seeing people in face to face. Great. Thank you again. Take care. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>